chapter 2, the book of Joshua chapter 2, and uh, I'm not going to give you the verse right now. I want to talk just a minute and then uh, bring you up to the verse that I'm going to read. I'm going to read about uh, a number of things, but in particular there's a central character in the chapter that I'm going to read. I'm going to read uh, about a woman. I don't think that you would have liked to have had her at that particular time to live next door to you. Her occupation was a dubious. Well, it was, a, it was an occupation that uh, is shameful, disgraceful. But before you get too sanctimonious and too good and better than anybody else, and before your criticism rings too strong about Rahab, you might ought to read over in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews and find out what bloodline she's in. Uh, here was a woman that most uh, dear ladies would have said, hmm. Uh, they would not have spoke to her down at the grocery store. I dare say that if they'd have saw their husband shaking hands with her, there'd have been a knot on his head, he'd have climbed a ladder to scratch. Well, she was shaking hands with that old, well, that was just that kind of girl. Oh, why, ooh, you know what? Well, that's the kind of woman she was. She was a harlot, a prostitute. And we're going to read about Rahab in just a minute. But let me also mention in my introduction, the children of Israel are on their way to the land of promise. I say, I say, I say they were on their way to the land of promise. They numbered in the millions, and they were heading that direction. And... Uh, they had to be Baptists because they had sent out spies. Baptists are notorious for business meetings. <laughs> and vote on anything. <laughs> but they had sent out spies even though the Lord had said, I'm going to give you the land. Now, you didn't have to vote on that. It was already settled. God had said it. That took care of it. But they nevertheless had sent out their spies to see their need. And they had no need in that department. Well, when they came to the city where Rahab lived, they turned in to Rahab's house. Well, now that would have got them thrown out of most Baptist churches right there because of people's imagination. People's got an awful vivid imagination, and sometimes it can run in the wrong direction. A man walked up to me the other day crying and said, You can't guess where I said, Oh, so and so and so. And I said, No. Where? He said, I just hate to tell you where he is at. Said, it's the awfulest thing that ever happened. He said, My heart just broke. I said, Where'd you see him? Said, I saw him in the phone booth. <laughs> see, his imagination had got away with him. He had that man talking to some woman, and oh, there was an office thing going on, amen? So the next time you see me in a phone booth, don't think I'm doing something bad. Well, they turned in to Rahab's house. Rahab, knowing possibly that they'd been seen, took them up on the roof of her house, the house having a flat roof, and she had flax. A uh, growth that was thrashed out, laying up there drying and getting ready to thrash. Rahab taking these men up and put them on the roof and covered them up with the flax. Goes back down in her dwelling quarters after she'd got them concealed. Sure enough, knock came at the door. Said Rahab, he said, we've got some spies loose in town. There are that children of Israel crowd that's marching through, and we've got to do something. Said, have you seen them? Now, you theologians will have a little problem with this, but I wouldn't have a nervous breakdown over it. Rahab said they went.
give that away. <laughs> oh, you said that was a lie. That's what I would say. You take it up with God. I ain't going to argue about it. Oh, I can just see some of you right now just worried sick about that. She said it went that way. If you'll take off after them, no doubt in the world you can catch them. You can catch them. Well, they didn't go that way, and they, they was up on the roof right then. Sure enough, Rahab had told one, but evidently God didn't get too shook up over it. Amen? But now Rahab goes back up to the roof, and we're going to take up our reading in verse 9. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land. That was her first statement. She never said, fellas, do you think you can take it? I wonder how you're going to come out when the big battle hits. She said, the Lord's done give it to you. The Lord has given you the land that your terror has fallen upon us. That all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you, and you came out of Egypt. What you did to the two kings of the Amorites, they're on the other side of Jordan, Jordan, Shehan, and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. As soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did I remain any more courage in any of us, any man, because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God. Are you listening? Said so you fellas are after the right God. You got the right one. <laughs> mm, there goes that shout again. Now you, you fellas have really got the right God. She said, we know the Lord your God. He is God. Now, how, where is he God at? He, she said, in heaven above and in earth beneath. She said, he just God all over. That girl's pretty smart. She may have been a harlot, but boy, she's a pretty smart girl. Now, therefore, I pray you swear unto me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness unto my Father's house and give me a true token. Our Father, help me now. I want to, I want to be a blessing to the folks here at Center Chapel. Lord, they've been so many blessings to me. They've helped me and encouraged me. Oh, God, I want to be a blessing. I want to encourage their hearts. Lord, I want to edify them through the Word of God. I thank you for Brother Mark, and I pray you'll bless him and his wife and his boys. And her. Oh, God, just bless his family. I may be passing this way the last time, but, oh, God, I'm glad you let me come back one more time. One more time. It's so good. I drove up yesterday, and precious memories flooded my soul. So, Lord, let me help them one more time. Let me encourage you, oh, God, let me. We'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Rehab did not say, Fellers, we hear that your arm is one of the biggest armies that's ever come through here. She had no reference to the number. She did not refer or make any reference at all to how many was in the army. She did not say, we've heard how that those men that shoot the bow and arrow are a crack shot. They never miss. She had no reference to the expertise of those that use the slingshot. She did not refer to any of the generals or the corporals or the sergeants. She made no reference at all to any of the artillery that they may have had. <clears throat> but right off of the bat, she said, 
We've heard how the Lord is with you. Today I want to preach on how the Lord makes a difference. It's amazing to me how many times we come down to the valley of discouragement and oh, we say, Lord, I hear that servant come running in from the field and said, I'm left alone to tell thee, did you never figure out it doesn't take many for God to use? God doesn't major in the numbers. Little is much when God is in it. It does not take a great moment. God does not stand back and wring His hands. Said, if I just find a few more, I believe I could really take Roanoke, Alabama. Oh, if we can just get a few. God can take what He's got and use it. Amen. So many times we think, if we don't have this or we don't have that, God will sure have a rough time. Oh, when I see how God has taken me and God bless your heart and use them. The Bible said He's not chosen the, of the mighty things, but He's taken the little bitty thing. Oh, Road Oak, Alabama, and Center Chapel, may I say to you today, I'm going to say to you, and I hope you'll get this and remember this, and put it in your soul and keep it. You stay true to God and walk with God. And God can and will continue to use you. I see so many preachers crying and saying, Oh, so many has left me. It's not who's left, it's who you've got. Jesus turned one day and said, Will you all so go away? They said in no uncertain terms, We ain't got nowhere else to go. We don't have nowhere to go. It's God! It's God that makes the difference. As long as God will have the sinner seat, the occupation of the high seat, you can move on for God. But if you ever get in it, you're in trouble. Amen. Do you know what knocks a lot of preachers down? It's like, you know, when he's reading about Herod the other morning. He took the sinner seat. They said, oh, that's not a man talking. I can tell right off that's not a man. Why, that don't even sound like a man. That sounds like a God. And he didn't give God the glory. He took the sinner seat. He took the high seat. And God said to the worms, get him. Amen. Get him. Sick him. Amen. As long as we will allow God in, in any place, our hearts, our lives, wherever it's at, to have that sinner high, exalt, lofty place, and us stay down where God can use us, God's still able to do what man don't think he can do. Amen. Notice, if you will. Notice. I remember one time I went to a preacher's meeting. Don't go to any of them no more. They turned into bragging me. I heard a preacher say a while back, he got up in the meeting and said, said well, I'm over at so-and-so now. Before I got there, they was in bad shape. But now since I'm there, <laughs> I thought, Lord God, gag a maggot. He said, before I got that altar down, but sit down there, he said, Who be do? Who be do? Folks, listen to me right now. Listen. Did you ever stop and think what God has? You, you pick out the men in the Bible, those old fishermen. I mean, it wasn't that God had to say, Oh, I've got to find me a smart one. Oh, where can I get me a smart one? I've got to have me a smart Oh, he's got to be. Oh, I've got to. No, no. God reached down a long time and got the base, the simple-minded, the uneducated, the unpolished, and took them and shut the world with them. Amen? Amen. Mm. Amen. I sometimes wonder why in the world did God pick me 
and I still ain't figured it out. But I'm glad he did. Amen. I was at a preacher's meeting, as I started to say, and, and uh, they had some great, outstanding doctors. I haven't got anything against them. Fine. I admonish and admire a man that will go on and get learning and not go ahead and get it. But after you've got it, let God have the preeminence. So that day, I'd heard so many doctors preach, I felt like I'd had a surgery without being put to sleep. With a dull case knife. And had forgotten to sew me up. <laughs> and after a while, I don't know how it happened, but somebody said, we've got old brother so-and-so here today, and uh, we'd like for him to give a word of testimony. Never called him a preacher. Never called him doctor. They, they, they just didn't put no titles on that stuff. And he got it up and right off. I knew he was my kind. He said, I ain't in Ewans and Themans. Lord, he slobbered and spluttered and he drank, seemed like a half a gallon of water. But after a while, God plugged him in. I don't mean he plugged him in and he turned him on. I have never heard such preaching since God ever made me, since I ever lived. You said, what was it? It was God that made the difference. It was God that got a hold of him and said, I'll use him to preach through. It's not our polish. It's not our style. It's not our personality. It's not our education. It's God that makes the difference, Alan. Mm -hmm. Years ago now, I remember I was in a certain large city and they asked me to come and they told the pastor where I was in revival to bring me over to the seminary. They wanted me to preach to the student body. Scared me to death. Honest. I listened. I was petrified. I tried to get sick to keep from going. Couldn't do it. Never felt as good in my life. I tried to take something. Couldn't do it. I just, and I, I told him, I said, I just can't go. He said, come on. And he got me over there and, and I was going to preach to the student body. House full and they, there's one big family there. Introduced me, never saw as many of them in my life. I, all, a lot of boys. Must have been no girls, but there's all boys. There's a whole lot of the Dean family there. There's Deans all over the place. And, and I've never met so many Deans in my life. There's a Dean of this and a Dean of that. And I said, that's the biggest family I've ever seen. Doctors all over the place. If I was going to get sick, I'd have done it right there. I never saw so many doctors and deans. And I'm scared. Oh, I don't mean just frightened. I was scared to death. I thought, Lord, I'll mess up in English or something right off. I'll say you and it's as sure as the world. And I knew that I'd be embarrassed. And uh, they got me up there, and one of them dean fellers sat over here, and a doctor sat over here, and, and they said, Now, Brother Blue, the evangelist is going to bring the message. Folks, I was petrified. I'm honest. Ooh, if I could have had them to bow their head, I'd have slipped out the side door. I was scared. But they got me up there, and I read, and after a while, God plucked me in. And I forgot about being scared. I forgot about my English. I forgot. I didn't know no Hebrew, no how, so I forgot about that before I got up there. Didn't know no Greek, so I didn't have no trouble in that department. But I'm just a preaching and a ranting and a raving and a slobbering on five rows and I'm a running and a jumping. And I went by that Dean feller sitting over here. I went by him and as I went by him, he said, ah! and jumped up and locked his legs around me and riding me like a horse. He had a wave and a handcuff and I just knew any minute he was going to say, hi, old silver. And I was making it pretty good. But I made the mistake of going by that doctor. And he said, Fire! And he got me on the other side. And I stopped and said, One of you going to have to get off. What I'm trying to say to you today, God, bless your heart. 
You've been standing back in the shadow and said, I can't do nothing. What can I do? First of all, I recommend you die to any personal importance or any evaluation of yourself that say you can or you're good and say, Lord, by the touch of God and by the power of God, I can and step out and say, I will, if you'll go with me. Amen. You can. They called me down to that school later. And I was honored and embarrassed and shy. And they gave me an honorary doctor's degree. A young preacher walked up to me after I got it. And he said, Brother Ed, can you preach better since you got your degree? I looked at him and I said, Son... Does a curl in a pig's tail make any more hog? That curl will make that fat rascal no better than he. I'm here to tell you, friend of mine, right now, I still got it, but it's never helped me out one time. I'm trying to tell you, November the 23rd, 1943, 20 minutes after 12, God called me by His own sovereign will and knowledge uh, to preach the Word of God. Uh, and still, after 37 years, uh, it's not me, but it's Him uh, that's able to do it. Hallelujah to God. Oh my, oh, my soul. God makes a difference. It's God that'll make the difference. You said, I want to go witness to so-and-so next week. I want to go witness to so-and-so tomorrow. I want to do that. I'll tell you what if you'll do. If you'll get on your face somewhere by yourself and say, God, I want you on me. I want you on my life. I want to go not in my, Lord, if it's tears, I want to go, with, Lord, I want you to do it. Now that you go that way, and you'll go bless your heart in a power that's mightier than man. We're talking about a God that makes the difference. You're supposed to begin a revival. I hope it starts today. I really do. But you know it could start today, right now. If in your own heart you say, Oh my God, I've somehow... I've not, I've failed to be out of the spout for the glory of the house. Lord, if there's anything in my life that would keep you from possessing my life, taking over my life, and taking charge of my life, I want it out of my life. That's the only way God can have real control of your life. God makes a difference. I mean, that's what makes the difference. When you see somebody that... How many of you love to see somebody preach or teach... Oh, with a power on them. Anytime I see a man up preaching, my old heart begins to stir. Oh, the warmth of the glory of God begins to flood my soul. I take that second look and I say, Thank you, Lord, that I know it's not Him, but I know it's you. I know it's not Him. I know it's not him. I I remember hearing people sing. I was in Wartburg, Tennessee last week in revival. And there's three ladies got up to sing. Oh, they wasn't good singers. They 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 really wasn't. They wasn't bad singers, but they wasn't good singers. Suddenly I I, I I was reading my Bible as they sang, and not that I was paying disrespect, I just glanced and again knew I was getting ready to preach. But suddenly, suddenly I was aware that there was something there besides their singing. And I looked up, and uh, I won't say which one, I don't mean it, I've already told you how I look, but let me tell you how she looked. There's one old girl that was, that was like me, she was extra homely. She wasn't around behind the barn when looks was passed out. She is overseas. But all of a sudden, I looked up. I was aware of something before I looked up. 
that something was a moving there. And I looked up and saw what it was. There, there's missing notes and the pianist. I believe she'd have played a different song. What they're saying. But all of a sudden, I looked up and that old uh, homely girl was twisting her hands. And, uh, you know, some tears got dropped. I believe hers was gallons. It had run down her face. And after a while, she had a song book. And she she didn't have to do it. She was getting look good, looking good to me then. And she covered up her face. And from behind it, she said, she quit saying, said, thank you, Lord. I sure do love you, Lord. I love you, and you're so sweet to me. And after a while, the song book that went that way. And that girl would have win a beauty contest. You said, what well, wasn't it? See, it was God that made the difference. God had reached down and touched that old uh, uh, homely girl. God had reached down and, and just cleaned her face with beauty that you don't get out of a jar. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, Avon don't sell it. There was a beauty there that it was radiating from God making the difference. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Now, you want to get in trouble, you try to bless somebody. If you want to get in real trouble, you try to be an inspiration to somebody. But if you want to really be a blessing, let Christ do it through you. Christ in you. The power of God in you. Don't you try to uh, spread your charisma around. Don't you try to do your little religious tinker toy. Ask God to take over in your life and let Him do it. Amen? Are you listening to me? You want to know who's been the biggest blessings in my life? I've met doctors. Oh, I've met some of the outstanding, the outstanding religious men of our day. I mean, oh, well, for instance, old R.G. Lee. But you know what it was that blessed me about R.G. Lee? It wasn't R.G. Lee. Suddenly I was aware. I was aware of that old man standing up there. And I saw something in him that wasn't born in Memphis. It was the power of God in him that shut my heart. Amen. So God makes a difference in everything. But let me just deal with about three or four points, and then I'm going to let you go today. God makes a difference in the heart. Now let me say this to you. Did you know what I'm finding in America today? More people have got head religion than they have heart religion. I heard Lester Rolock say one time as he was dealing with the subject, nobody could do it quite like Lester. He said, some folks said, no, oh, if I could just get my mouth cleaned up and I quit telling. He said, it's not your mouth, it's your heart. Oh, you said, if I could just get off of that dance floor, it's my feet. He said, it's not your feet, it's your heart. Oh, you said, if I could just get my mind to think. He said, it's not your mind, it's your heart. See, the thing about it is that David said, my heart is fixed. My heart, oh, my heart's been fixed. If you ever get your heart fixed, get all that old bitterness and, and get all that hatred and get it full of love and just say, Lord, I don't want nothing, nothing in there that's ugly in me. But God, give me a good heart. Then God bless your heart, you could begin to be a blessing to somebody. Amen. Do you know the folks that's blessed me the most have not been have not been what men call great men? Have you heard? I believe you've got that message back there on the table on prayer that I preached. You folks are men. Have any of you? How many of you heard the message on prayer? I preached. Do you remember I said in that church at the time I had some millionaires that were members and doctors and I had some outstanding men, earthly speaking. But if you remember, there was one person in that message that I had reference to. It was a little mentally retarded boy. Billy. He couldn't talk to him. He just faced The night he was praying, he said, Lord, me told you love you. If you were here, Lord, me give you sugar. He said, me hug on that and get give you sugar. <laughs> you 
said, what made him so unusual? A little mentally retarded mind. But I believe a heart as wide as a business. You know what's wrong with the average church member? They got heart trouble. Just get your heart right. And everything else will be all right. So God makes a difference in the heart. Then next of all, and my God, how we... God makes a difference in the home. God makes a difference. You can't come out of a home full of bitterness and come into a church and smile just because you can put on your smile and show your eye pan a toothpaste smile. That don't mean you're going to be a blessing. You come out of a home with bitterness and strife, and, and uh, it, it'll be on you. It'll be on you. I don't care how you smile. And all you said, I don't care how you smile. That, that, that stuff. You, you listen, you hang around skunks, you know what you smell like? You catch on fast around you. You always have been smart around right? you. You just feel extra smart when you walk. You walk through a little garden and come out. But you walk through bitterness and strife and anger and all of a sudden you want How are you? You do that. That don't mean that's all. Amen. He'll hinder your preaching, he'll hinder your teaching, he'll hinder your singing. He'll hinder everything that ought to be there from being there. Amen. God makes a difference in the heart. God makes a difference in the home. I remember. You know, it takes more than stacking a brick on top of a brick and mortar, hand and nail. It takes more than that to make a home. Now, you can build a house, but you can't build a home to save your life. You ain't no way in the world. There's not a blueprint in the world laid down by man that can take you. Now listen, now you can build a home with nails and hammer and salt. You can do it. You can take a tar paper shack. I mean a tar paper shack. And it can be a home. And you can take a two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand dollar house that takes no way in the world you can make it a home. Somebody wrote a poem one time and said it takes a lot of living to make a house a home. I'm going to tell you something. You want a home? You better get God in there. That'll make the difference. Get me all the tar paper around it and over it. But if you got God in there, that'll make all the difference in the world. So God will make a difference in the home. Let me hurry. Then God makes a difference in the hour of our hardships. Now, I'm not going to relate to anything so you don't have to draw up and be afraid. But Sinner Chapel, you went through some hardships. I don't know whether you're all through them or not. There may be a few more rotten chunks up there that'll have to fall. I don't know. And they may fall on some of you. But let me tell you right now, I don't care how hard the hardships get if Jesus is with you. I've said this many times, and you've heard me say it. I've had everything in the world hold on me except steal a nigger baby and paint him white. I was telling Brother Mark, I might as well tell you folks the latest one that's out on me. My wife knows about it. They told this on me. Now, this is the truth. It's being told now. There's a preacher telling me why he took it. I don't know. You said, Do you anger at him? God is my witness. There's not a drop of it. I like that a lot. And he's telling that I own. I don't mean I rent or lease her. I own and operate a topless nightclub in Knoxville. Don't that shake you up? No. No. Well, you said, don't that make folks hurt with you? Now, it may. But if you're having problems with that, I'm sorry. That's not my problem. Amen. Well, you said, aren't you trying to get it straightened out? No, I wouldn't even crank up my car to drive. Like that. You said, what is it? It's a lie. But as long as God lives in here, I know I'm not guilty. I don't have to worry about it. Some of you running around right now trying to straighten things out. If you just turned over to God and quit worrying about it and said, Lord, there it is. I'm going to live for you in spite of it. Why, well, you'd be a whole lot better off. Amen. Amen. You could probably get off some of your nerve pills. Well, you know what I mean. Don't you? God makes a difference in your hardships. When that last bit of money is out of the pocketbook and the bank's looking at you for that. <laughs> Amen. 
God said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Did you notice what that lady said a while ago when she was up here? She said, we didn't have things like back then like we have now. But she said, and you might have missed this, she said, God was with us. <laughs> you know why some of you are chewing your fingernails off your elbow right now? Because you're wrestling in human strength and human ability and human power to try to work some of your problems out. Why don't you turn it over to the Lord? Amen. The Lord makes a difference. And then God makes a difference in the hour of death. Somebody asked me here a while back, said, what, what do you think, Brother Lester? was thinking about when that plane was falling. Well, I believe what I'm about to say as much as I believe my hands on my arm. If there's anybody in the world that I believe could have done this, I believe Lester Olaf could have done it. I believe he just said, Come in home! <laughs> Amen. And if God had let him, he'd have stuck a head of lettuce with him. And a carrot. <laughs> I could just see Lester going into heaven with a carrot in his pocket. Amen. You stop. Don't you believe that everybody's got to be a prize out of it? I'm not saying that everybody wants to die. I don't. You don't. But I believe there are special dying grace in that hour. Yeah. And I believe God makes the difference in that hour. I saw old saints leave this world with a smile on their face and their hands raised toward heaven saying, Lord, I'm on my way. Amen. Then I saw men dying without God that you had to hold them on the bed. God makes the difference. That's what the difference is. At. That's what will make the difference in your life. Then let me close by making this statement. God makes a difference in the hereafter. Whoa, now, preacher, you're not going to preach that a man's got a chance to be saved hereafter. No, I'm going to tell you right now, you better be saved when you get to the hereafter. You say, what do you mean it makes a difference? When I see the blood, I'll pass over. My friend, if you don't have God, then it's too late. God's going to make all the difference then. That's all the difference right then. And you say, well, I believe you'll let me in. I've been pretty good. There ain't no such thing as that junk. You'll either know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior then, or you'll miss it. You'll miss it. I mean, you'll miss it. You'll miss it. I want to become the piano, please. I'm through. You said you don't preach as long as you used to. No, I'm not able. I'm not physically able to preach as long as I used to. I'm not. <laughs>